Why was this allowed to happen to us? Okay, so you should be coming from part six of this series. These videos are part of a docu-series and should be watched from the beginning in order if you're going to understand what is being presented. So if you've not watched parts one through six, please stop this video and start back from video one and watch them consecutively for true context. Okay, well, like I've been saying through parts one through six, we are not black people. But in part six, I finally have given you enough information that I can now prove why I have said this. You are not a black person. You are a descendant from the house of Israel and Judah, and your heritage has been stripped from you. Now, here's the thing. This understanding is not popular, and I know it will not be easily accepted by all, but it is the truth. And the reason why I'm taking my time to explain this so in depth is because of how vitally important this truth is for all, not just for those who are truly the descendants of Israel and Judah, but for those who believe in the Bible and are attaching themselves to the promises that are given, those who believe in the Messiah, Yahusha. Now, the thing is that Protestant Christianity teaches a totally different doctrine than what is actually in the Bible. And so those that are tied more to religious doctrines of men and this Christian church, rather than what the Bible actually says, you will find that most of them will reject the importance of this message because it does not fit with what they have been told. And so when you try to understand this with them, you will find that the majority of the problem with their understanding is that this part of the Bible that's called the Old Testament, they pretty much have ignored what is written in it and believe that everything that is important is only in the New Testament. So imagine having a belief, but you only know what the back of the book says and nothing about what's in the middle. They're reading Joel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Habakkuk. They're, they're reading prophets that by and large in the Christian church today, those books don't even exist, right? We, we, we pastors, we read Malachi to tell people to pay their tithes. Other than that, we don't have any use for Malachi, right? And this is what's going on. So they're reading these scriptures. First of all, he's reading something I didn't even know was in my Bible, right? And for the record, this man, who is a pastor, by the way, his name is Dumasani Washington. He was just admitting what the truth is for most, except he's proud of it. The reason why I stress the importance of this understanding is about what's written in the middle of this book. So for anyone who has an issue and seeks to come against you, ask them to speak about their understanding of the middle of the Bible and not just the end of it. Ask them what the prophets have prophesied about the last days and our promises. You see, you can't believe that Yahusha is the Messiah without understanding what was prophesied about him, and that's all in the middle. And you see, the same way we know he is Messiah, we also know about the promises because he's intertwined with it all. Anyways, the point I'm saying is that this information and understanding places you in like a religious war that only can be fought against you while you live through their lie. And you see, they desperately desire to keep this lie alive. So for anyone that speaks against what I'm saying, please identify their fruit. Are they talking about me? Or are they just talking in denial and accusations without any meat behind it? Or are they actually talking about prophecies from the actual prophets? Those are the only conversations that you should actually entertain, those who talk about what the prophets are saying, because that's all that matters. There is a great deal that you can review to understand if someone's critique is genuine or if it's based on hate or their own indoctrination that they can't let go of, or if they're just an agent seeking to keep you down. I have gone through the six parts of the series without mentioning this part of it, but now that I have thoroughly explained myself, the enemy is really poking at his head. In the end, what you believe, it's completely up to you. Understand my job is not to force you to accept this information. My job is to present it to you properly so that it can be understood and you can make your own mind up and do your own research. I'm highlighting this now because religion is now being brought into it. And the emotions that come from people hearing something different than what they have been brought up to believe, especially when it has to deal with topics like racism and a people that they have wrote off as being nothing, they're actually being shown to actually have history, it could overwhelm people and instead of them acting rationally and taking time to think, it's easier to just attack. So I want you to be mindful of this. Another question and thing that's often done is the labeling and putting me in a group. The question is, am I a part of those Hebrew Israelite camps that are on the corners yelling at white people and rejecting them and telling them that they have no hope? 
The answer is no, I am not a part of the group that's called Hebrew Israelites. I categorically reject these brothers, but I do love them as brothers and pray for the fall or repentance of their leaders and for all of them to come back to the message Yahusha gave the church of Ephesus and do not be a part of the loveless assembly. Anyways, don't tie me to them. Just because you hear me say you are an Israelite, that does not mean that I'm a part of these groups of Israelites. Many of these groups are led by infiltrators who are taught the truth through a lens of hate and they were sent out to tarnish the truth before it was ready to be received. So don't put me in any groups and labels. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyways, let me continue with this discussion. In part six, I reversed history in order to show you who you are, those that descend from the transatlantic slave trade. There's a great deal more history I could show and deal with. Like in that video, I did not deal with the Spanish Inquisition in Spain removing the true Yahudim in 1492 when they went to Portugal and the Portuguese sent these same ones to Africa, later picking them back up to bring them to South America. The black Portuguese are Hebrews. I also did not go into Queen and Zinga and the Angolese and what happened with these tribes and who they are in South Africa. I have much more to clarify. What I wanted to do in part six was thoroughly explain history so you know who you are. You are a descendant of the house of Israel and Judah, and what has happened to you is not a secret. It is actually all tied up in the word, but this is why they have controlled religion. They want you to understand the Bible from the points that they highlight, while you ignore extremely important understandings that provide clarity. So the question is, if we are Hebrews from the house of Israel and Judah, why is this our predicament? To answer that question, it can help you if you yourselves go back a few generations to when we had real culture of morals and values in our own communities. I'm talking about going back in time before hip hop and this modern black culture that we have today. Back in the day, we had respect for our elders. And even though we had a large percentage of single parent households, our young children still have respect for their elders and our elders did not play. The reason why they took our fathers out of the homes in the first place is because our men were the biggest and strongest line of defense from this system. You know what they used to do, how they used to raise us. Our fathers would knock us out. My parents' generation definitely got that. My dad has nothing but stories about this. The point I'm getting at is that our parents had rules and in their households, if they broke those rules, they were punished severely. I think many of you should at least understand that. But maybe for the younger generation of today, my children's generation, maybe you don't really understand. I don't know. The point I'm getting at is that just like our parents scolded and reared us for disobedience and rejection of their rules, it is no different than what the Most High did. Our parents and that culture of rearing the child is a culture of Israel. You know, for me personally, when I was young, I would often look at the other communities, like the children of Japheth that I went to school with. And it was rare to me, at least, that they actually got spankings. I am not saying all. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just speaking about the overall culture, at least from what I came to know about it. I don't think they got spankings. On television, I would hear about children getting grounded. I didn't know what that was. You accept responsibility, you're not driving, and you're grounded for a month. Mister, you are grounded. And no TV. And I'm taking all the exciting colors out of your crayon. That's it. You're grounded. <laughs> you can't ground me, I'm a grown man. You wanna live here? You respect the rules of our house. You're grounded! Our grounding was an obvious thing that I guess would come after our butt whooping. Anyways, the Bible says, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. The same way that we are taught to raise our children and discipline them is the same way the Most High deals with us. Let me back up a little and explain this. This is the part of the Bible that's not explained in these churches. When the children of Israel entered into a covenant with the Most High, Yahuwah, he explained their arrangement to them very clearly. He gave them a way of life and rules to follow, and he told them that they must obey them. He said, Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am Yahuwah. That's Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31. 
You shall diligently keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of Yahuwah, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land of which Yahuwah swore to your fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 17 through 18. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of Yahuwah your Elohim to walk in his ways and to fear him. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6. You shall walk after Yahuwah your Elohim and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahuwah your Elohim, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that Yahuwah your Elohim will. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. If you read the Old Testament, this is how he spoke with Israel and communicated with them. This is what he desired for them. He desired obedience. As he spoke with each generation, he carefully spoke to them and gave them this message. When he chastised them and rejected them, it was for not heeding this. They did not listen, and he chastised them. This is important to understand when understanding Israel. As you read through the Old Testament, you see the many different times that Yahuwah spoke to Israel, and when he was pleased with them, he blessed them, and when he was angry with them, he cursed them. These were his people that he chose unto himself. And so, as I just explained, a very big understanding of Israel goes into the agreement Israel made with Yahuwah the Most High. A foundation of understanding Israel should be found in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In this chapter, he says to Israel, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahuwah your Elohim, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that Yahuwah your Elohim will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of Yahuwah your Elohim. That's Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 2. And then the curses. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. Israel was meant to be an example of Yah to the whole world, especially if they would have been obedient and walked in his ways. But nevertheless, Everything that they did and they went through is a testimony to us. We learn of their successes and their failures. We understand Yahuwah through their eyes because they are the only nation in the world to deal with them and have a personal covenant with them. The unfortunate truth that we all must deal with is that Israel did not follow Yahuwah. They followed after other gods and became separate from Yah. After Solomon, Israel was divided and the northern ten tribes declared their own king and Judah and Benjamin were separate and they declared their own. So Israel was divided. There was the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. The northern tribes went into straight wickedness and they were conquered first by the Assyrians and they never returned as a whole back to their land. Judah was conquered after Israel and were carried off by Babylon. They eventually did come back to the land and they rebuilt the temple. This was the second temple. When they returned back to their land, they were referred to as Jews which stem from Judah. Actually, it's Yahudim. And they came back in Israel, not as strong as they were originally when they were following Yah. And they were prophesied of a redeemer from the line of King David, and many of them expected him to be like King David and unite the kingdom again and bring back peace in their land, removing the hand of the Romans that were now in control over their land of Judea. I am skimming through information I have explained in greater detail in other videos. So, the house of Israel was fallen and scattered. They did not come back to the land, but the house of Judah did, and they did have history. Now, Judah never returned to the way it was before they were captured and taken into Babylon. Things had changed for them. There were no real leaders, and the leaders that were in charge were corrupt, and they served themselves. These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees I'm talking about. There were Hebrews that did continue in the law, and a lot of others that tried to assimilate with the world empires. The Hebrews later refer to many of these people as Greeks. Long story short, the Jews of Judea began to wait on their Redeemer that was prophesied to them, and they waited for our Messiah to come to them. And that's all found in the prophecies that the prophet spoke of that I talk about that's in the middle of the book. And here's the thing, eventually Yahusha the Messiah did come unto them, but they crucified him and put his blood 
on themselves and on their children. The scriptures say, Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scored Yahusha, he delivered him to be crucified. That's Matthew chapter 27, verses 23 through 26. So here's the thing. They put the Messiah's blood on them and their children. A very wrong mistake to do. And this is just a very condensed part of the history. The point is that Israel was a hard-headed group that was in constant rebellion of the Most High, and they were chastised for it. The first punishment they received was bondage and captivity, which is no different than what our ancestors have had to deal with. The summary that you need to understand, if you understand the basics of the Bible, it's broken down like this. Yahuwah had a chosen people that he was in covenant with. He told them that he would bless them if they obeyed him and he would curse them if they rejected him. He was very specific with what he said would happen if he cursed them. The question you want to ask yourself is based on the Bible and the history of what we know of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The question is, do you think that they were obedient or disobedient? And based upon that answer, do you think that the Most High right now will be blessing them or would he be cursing them? This is an important biblical decision you yourself have to decide if you're going to understand the world today, particularly in regards to the Bible. Based upon the scripture, it is clear to me that Israel rejected Yahuwah and he cursed them. There's no reason to believe that he blessed them. They crucified the Messiah and they sought after other gods. And this is them as a whole. Now, if he did not prophesy later about redeeming them, then you know what? You can understand why Christians think that everything is now about them. But as I said earlier in this video, in the middle of this Bible, he has prophesied a great deal about what he would do in the last days after he scolded them. He said he would take them through Jacob's trouble, but they then would be saved out of it. Jacob's trouble means Israel's trouble because Jacob represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's read about it and understand specifically what he said. Now these are the words that Yahuwah spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says Yahuwah, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says Yahuwah of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve Yahuwah their Elohim and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says Yahuwah, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of that captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says Yahweh, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. For thus says Yahweh, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wounds of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable because of the multitude of your iniquities because your sins have increased. I have done these things to you. That's Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 4 through 15. <laughs> I mean, and that seems very clear. Do you follow this? 
You see, this is a part of the Bible that's really not discussed. Understand, I'm just reading scripture. He said this. This is not me. Yahuwah said, I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. That's verse 11 of chapter 30. He also said, because your sins have increased, I have done these things to you. That's verse 15. He said, for thus says Yahuwah, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable. Because of the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased, I have done these things to you. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 12 through 15. So, as we have all wondered, we've wondered why. Why is this our life? Why do people hate us? Why do we have all of this affliction? The crazy thing that I have found was that the answer to my question of why was in the Bible. The same Bible that I had all my life, that my mother and grandmother had, the answer was all in there, but because of lies and oppression and false teachers, I was not able to connect dots of my heritage, nor was I even encouraged to read these scriptures. The reason why we have dealt with the problems that we have had in our lives is wholly due to our sins and the sins of our ancestors that we have been paying for. When the Yahudim were in Babylon as slaves, many of them were paying for sins that they themselves did not commit. I'm talking about people like Daniel. They were held in Babylon and it wasn't their sins that they committed. They were cast out because of their forefathers' sins. The Israelites who never came back have been dealing with this for a great deal of time. This is why our history does not show great power because anytime we set ourselves up, things were taken from us and the final straw came to our people when they began to convert to Islam and Christianity in order to stay protected from this world. So get this clearly. The answer to the question of why is because our ancestors rejected and rebelled against the Most High and were disobedient to Him. And for this reason, he caused them to be cursed and they were in great trouble. Our lives have been a result of Jacob's trouble, but there is a good part to this story. I intentionally skipped over verses 1 through 3 of Jeremiah 30 and also verses 16 through 24. I'm going to show you. This is what verses 1 through 3 says. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahuwah saying, Thus speaks Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says Yahuwah, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Again, that's Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. You see, that's the blessing. Jacob's trouble is about our punishment, but it's also about our blessing that we will be saved out of it. Here's verses 16 through 24. Therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder, and all who prey upon you I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says Yahuwah, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, no one seeks her. Thus says Yahuwah, Behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mound and the palace shall remain according to its own plan. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who make merry, I will multiply them and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as before and the congregation shall be established before me and I will punish all who oppress them. Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me? Says Yahuwah. You shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. Behold, the whirlwind of Yahuwah goes forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of Yahuwah will not return until he has done it and until he has performed the intents of his heart. 
In the latter days, you will consider it. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 16 through 24. And so understand, we will be blessed. Those that repent and come back to him, we will be blessed. And also get this, those who did us wrong, they have judgment upon them. And there is so much more he says to this. I've only scratched the surface of what is actually prophesied. The thing you need to consider is why you may not have heard it this way. Who has been controlling religion and who have you been taught by? Mind you, it's not like they're just not applying this to you. They're not applying this at all. Most people don't know these scriptures. This is not an understanding in mainstream Christianity at all. And there is a reason for it. It's because they are shepherds leading the sheep to slaughter. And they have been using gatekeepers to keep you blind and from applying the word in full yourself. He says he's doing this in the last days. But again, most people don't even have this expectation at all, much less know who it applies to. As a matter of fact, the way Jacob's trouble is applied today is about the Jews in Israel today and what will happen during the Great Tribulation after the Christian church is raptured. This is the major false way that this is all applied. All done so that the truth is hidden. The point is that the answer to the question of why has all this been allowed to happen to us has now been answered. It has happened to us because of the disobedience of our ancestors and our only way out of it is through repentance and belief in Messiah. While we go back and be obedient to the Most High, we come back to his statutes, his laws, his commandments and how he has always desired us to live. I will speak on more of that soon. But now that you understand the answer to the question, I want to show you how specific he was when he said how he would judge us. I also want to show you the only sign that he said that would be upon his people that we would know who they were actually were. So we will continue on and explain this in the next part of the series. Just remember, right now, many of you watching are the dry bones and it's time that you are awakened. And this series is trying to do just that. So now that you understand who you are, you are a descendant from the house of Israel and Judah, and your life has been cursed because of the rebellion of you and your ancestors. Please continue on to the next part and allow me to explain what those curses actually have been prophesied to be. I hope that by now that you have made it this far in the series, it has at least got you thinking. Right now, many of you are the dry bones. And as Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 11 says, you may believe your hope is lost and you yourselves are cut off, but I am here to show you that the complete opposite is true. Your hope is not lost and you yourselves are not cut off. If you just awaken and be who you truly are. So I will show you. Click the link to the next video and let's talk some more about it. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please make sure to like this and share this video with your family and friends. Again, this is not just a video to share, but to watch together with your family and friends, and I hope this is being helpful to them. It is intended to start the conversation that many of you can lead personally. So please use this and help your family and friends that allow you to. This is part seven of the series. Click this link or just move on to the next video in the playlist. As always, I want to thank all who donate and contribute to this ministry. Always know that this series would not be possible without your support. I thank you sincerely. Be blessed. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. See you in part eight. I love you all.